In this lesson, we're going to take a look at how a scene is organized and all the different ways we can select and isolate objects to work on. In Blender, what you can see in the 3D viewport directly impacts how they can be selected. The default general layout should be very familiar by now. Currently, all the objects in the scene are visible, so selecting them shouldn't be an issue. But if I rotate my view so that the cube blocks out the camera, for example, I'm not going to be able to select the camera, at least not easily. What is closest to us in our viewport is what Blender will deem immediately selectable. Our default viewport shading is set to solid, so any objects with faces or surfaces are going to obscure other objects depending on the depth in relation to our view. There are a couple of ways you can get to objects that are obscured by other objects, even before resorting to the outliner or rotating your view, which would be the obvious choice. Let's take an example with a row of cubes, angled so that we only see one. I'm going to split my view here so we can see all the cubes on the left, but we'll focus selecting on the right. I can left click and select my first cube. If I click a second time, this second cube along is selected. A third, fourth, fifth time, each cube, depending on the depth away from our view, is selected. Now, if we hold down Alt and left click on this first visible cube, you should get a list pop up of all the objects which fall under your cursor, and you can select them from here. Let's toggle into edit mode while we're still in solid shading mode for the moment. We see the vertices and edges overlaid on our cube, and we can select what we see. But we're not able to select what we don't. Even our Alt left click trick won't work because we can't see where the back vertices are and they don't line up with where our cursor is here. If you needed to select all the components of this cube, and it was the only object in edit mode, you could hit a, and this would select all of the vertices. Or you could select one vertex, hover your mouse over the cube, and hit L, and anything linked to that vertex will get selected. We've currently been working in solid shading mode, but we have some other options on how objects look in our viewport. These four icons up here will switch between wireframe, solid, material, and rendered shading. Currently, the icon that is highlighted in blue indicates solid viewport shading is on. Let's click on the icon to the left of the solid. It's a wireframe sphere. You might notice that the icon to the left of this automatically activates when in this mode. This icon is X-ray mode. And if we toggle it off while we're in wireframe, we lose this ability to see through objects, a hint of what we're about to discover. I'll switch back into solid view shading. This time I'll use the hotkey Z and choose solid from the radial menu. If we activate the X-ray button now, it will lower the opacity of your objects, allowing you to see through faces and surfaces. The hotkey to toggle X-ray mode on and off is Alt Z. This is an excellent tool for working in edit mode when you need to select vertices or edges or faces obscured by geometry. You can hide specific objects by selecting them, then go into your object menu, go down to show hide and choose hide selected. The hotkey is H and there are modified versions to assist hiding and showing. You can use Alt H to show any hidden objects. You can also use Shift H to hide anything that is not selected. Soloing an object or local view is a feature that is similar to hiding, but works in a slightly different way. In this scene, there's some liquid inside the bottle. I'm going to toggle into Material Preview so I can see through the bottle at the liquid, and I'll use my Alt left click trick to select the liquid inside. I'll go to my view menu and go down to local view. The hotkey for this 
is your backslash on the numpad. The bottle liquid object is zoomed in and everything else is made invisible. Our text info overlay, one of the options under our viewport overlays, will have the word local in brackets here. If we zoom out, you won't notice anything else in the scene until you toggle out of solo view. This also works for multiple selections. I'll select the table and tablecloth, hit numpad backslash, and now only these are visible. Blender also gives you options to clean up your viewport of overlays that you might not need, or toggle the visibility of entire categories of objects. This is handy when you're working in more complex scenes. These three drop downs, left of the X ray mode, offer a range of options. The first one is our selectability and visibility overlay. Here, you can toggle off the visibility or selectability of any category of objects all at once. This is great if you have multiple cameras, lights, or objects like armatures or lattices, and you want to focus, say, on this character's mesh. In this case, we will make the armatures invisible. But you can also just toggle off their selectability. You can still see them, but they won't get selected when you're trying to click on something underneath. The next drop down allows you to show or hide gizmos. The blue indicates this is active, and if we disable it, all the gizmos we looked at in the first lessons are now hidden. Just clicking on Navigate hides the same tools. You'll notice that the boxes under Object Gizmos are not enabled. Ticking the boxes next to each makes the Move, Rotate and Scale gizmos all appear over our cube. This means that we can select them without having to toggle into our Move, Rotate or Scale tools. There's even a drop down above this section, which allows us to orient these to a number of views. Empties, lights, and cameras also have gizmos which are enabled by default, and each have specific use cases. Some light objects have got direction and size gizmos. These are enabled by default, and you can disable them if you prefer to set your size or direction another way. Next are the viewport overlays. Disabling the button makes the 3D viewport look very plain because you're hiding the floor grid, axis lines, the camera, even the orange outlines which tell you if an object is selected or if it's an active object. Now all of these can be toggled on or off individually and most are self-explanatory. There's one more option which only becomes active when in edit mode. So let's select the cube and toggle into edit mode to see the mesh edit mode overlays. The most obvious overlays here that we can enable are currently disabled. These are overlays such as measurement and normals. Measurement will show you the length, angle, and area information for selected vertices, edges, and faces. Normals will show you the direction that the face or vertex is pointed, and it also has a split normals mode, and that's a more advanced option for specific workflows. You can increase or decrease the length of this normal line should you need. Another handy feature is to have the normal set at a specific pixel dimension. So if you zoom in or out, the normal will stay the same size relative to the size of your screen. Other options deal with types of edge marks you're able to see edges that are marked as seams for UV unwrapping, creases for when your surface requires sharp edges as well as smooth ones. And you can even see indices or analysis overlays for more specific cases where this information might be necessary to view. Now you may have noticed that as we've worked in the 3D viewport, several of these operations get reflected in the outliner. The obvious one is when we hide or show something. Let's select the cube here in our viewport, hit H to hide it, and take note of what occurs in the outliner. This icon that looks a bit like an eye 
is now closed, and the cube object is greyed out. If we click on the closed eye to open it, the cube reappears in our viewport. This visibility is one of several restriction toggles that you can enable for objects and collections in the Outliner. Three are active by default, and you can see many more options if we click on this filter icon here. But most of these deal with subjects for later, such as rendering and compositing, so we won't focus on these for now. If you've come to Blender from software such as Maya, you might be familiar with groups. Now we can think of collections as a version of grouping objects, but in the Outliner, these are more akin to layer groups that you'd find in Photoshop. We can see that there is a scene collection here, inside of which is nested another collection simply named Collection, and nested inside of this are our three default objects, listed in alphabetical order, Camera, Cube, and Light. I'm going to rename our collection to Scene Objects. I can double click on the name and just type something in. I'll now select the Scene Collection, right click on it, and create a new collection. Let's rename this to Meshes. It is now nested under Scene Collection. We can click on the cube and drag this into the Meshes collection. Now the cube is nested inside of that. If we click on the eye next to Scene Objects, the camera and light are now hidden in our viewport, but we can still see the cube. Dragging and dropping objects between collections in the Outliner is the obvious way to organize them. However, you're able to select an object in the viewport and use the hotkey M to bring up your collection menu and select where you would like this object to be nested. Note that any new collection will be created inside the active collection. So for example, if we accidentally move our cube to a new collection inside the scene objects collection, we can just drag that collection out of there. Any objects inside that will also be moved. Collections don't really affect how objects can be selected or manipulated in the 3D viewport. However, there are many uses for collections beyond merely organizing. When it comes to using modifiers, geometry nodes, and instancing, collections can play a big role, but these are topics for more advanced courses. So now that you know a little bit about showing and hiding and collections, practice organizing the objects in your scene. Also practice switching between wireframe and solid shading and using the X-ray mode. Once you've got your head around these concepts, let's move on to the next lesson.